Hello, welcome to Scholars Hub at Home. I'm Allison Gantel, Associate Director of Alumni Programs at York University. Thank you for joining us today. This webinar is part of our Scholars Hub speaker series and features timely and relevant educational lectures by academics and researchers from York. We're pleased to be able to bring this series online to allow even more alumni and friends to hear from some of the university's leading scholars. Before we begin, I want to share some exciting news. Last month, a groundbreaking event marked the beginning of construction on York's Markham Center campus. This $275 million, 10-story, state-of-the-art campus is expected to open in fall 2023 and welcome over 4,000 students. Also, I wanted to highlight the York U Better Together website where university updates, community stories, and profiles of alumni, professors, and staff are shared. The website can be found at ubettertogether.info.yorku.ca. And to stay in the know with university stories and updates, make sure you're receiving our monthly e-newsletter called Alumni Matters. The October issue arrived in inboxes last week, and it's chock full of alumni-specific content, university updates, other virtual events, and so much more. If by chance you're not receiving Alumni Matters and would like to, please contact us at alumni at yorku.ca. Although we aren't all in the same location, we recognize many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Before beginning today's lecture, we always like to get to know our audience by asking, how would you rate your understanding of today's topic? A poll should come up on your screen right now. I'll give everyone a moment to respond. Thank you for participating in this poll. It's interesting to see um, that a lot of us, uh, including myself, are, are quite new or have some minimal knowledge of this, of this topic. So it's sure to be a really interesting and informative session. It's really helpful for us to have an idea about our audience's level of understanding of the topic. For a little housekeeping, if you do need any help with the Zoom webinar, please feel free to click on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen and enter your question. We have a team that's ready to help you. That same button can be used to submit questions for our guest speakers to answer during the Q&A period that will follow our presentation. And for any of you watching live on Facebook, please feel free to submit any questions or comments through the comment section for the video and the team will send your questions my way. So today's talk is titled, Tattoos and Trauma, Why We Commemorate, featuring Deborah Davidson, Associate Professor, Department of Sociology within our Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies here at York University. Please be advised that the subject matter in this presentation, although vital to validating the experiences of many, touches on sexual assault and suicide and could be triggering to some members of our audience. Deborah Davidson, it is an associate professor at York University and a tattooed sociologist with research and writing interests in the areas of loss and bereavement and support for and creativity within trauma and grief. She has published on these issues and in the areas of motherhood, health, methodology, and pedagogy. You can read more about tattoos and commemoration in the Tattoo Project, Commemorative Tattoos, Visual Culture, and the Digital Archive, which was published by herself, Davidson, in 2017 with Canadian Scholars Press. Welcome, Dr. Davidson. It's a pleasure to have you join us today. 
Well, thank you. I'm really happy to be here. I will now share my screen. Wonderful. Over to you. All right. So thank you all for your interest in commemorative tattoos, new or developing, whatever that might be. Our tattoos help us communicate our life experiences, our joys, sorrows, accomplishments, and dreams. They provide us with the opportunity to talk about what is important to us and what might otherwise be silenced and stigmatized. In talking about our tattoos, we may even expose the elephant in the room that others avoid, but that benefits from exposure and communication. It's interesting to know that COVID-19 has been a traumatic experience for many, and we are beginning to see tattoos speaking to that particular trauma. Today, I'll be sharing with you the following. Briefly, I'll tell you about the Tattoo Project, provide a brief history and prevalence of tattoos, then I'll move to the place of tattoos in helping their bearers to speak about remake meaning, and to aid in the healing after traumatic events. The Tattoo Project is a collaborative community effort to archive and exhibit tattoos along with their stories. Stories about experiences that are linked into the body and etched into memory. I'm often asked, why is the elephant the logo for your project? This elephant is also a, a tattoo on my forearm. Well, I'll tell you. Elephants are conscious, intelligent, and emotional beings who encode experiences into long-term memory. They are highly sociable, forming strong bonds and providing social support and compassion. They have a highly developed sense of empathy, altruism, and justice and they too can suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. They also perform rituals to mourn their dead. Unlike the elephant in the room of humans, that which is present but intentionally avoided, like trauma, elephants see, face, and communicate. For more information, please visit my website and read about the book, which is an edited collection written by scholars and persons with their own tattoo stories. The earliest archaeological evidence of tattoos goes back over 5,000 years. However, artifacts that may have been used for tattooing go back 10,000 to 50,000 years. By 1000 BC, tattooing was found virtually everywhere but Antarctica. Tattoo is from the Tahitian word tatatu, meaning an act done with a hand several times. Interestingly, we are seeing that poke and stick tattoos are now trending. As opposed to the use of machines for tattoos, poke and stick is created with a single sterile tattoo needle, which is also attached to a stick. The needle is then repeatedly poked into the skin to recreate dots and eventually a tattoo design, similar to what was done a long time ago. Tattooing is one of the most persistent forms of body modification. More than 25% of North Americans have at least one tattoo. And if you have one, you'll probably know that they're rather like potato chips. You want more. Many of these tattoos are commemorative tattoos. Those that remember, honor, and acknowledge. My research shows that up to 80% of tattoos are for commemoration. While tattoos have been most recognized as marks of deviance, they have also been used for spiritual and decorative purposes as sacred and secular art and as part of sacred ceremonies marking social position, power, and strength of character. 
One of the points I'd like to stress today is that tattoos have never been limited to their relationship with deviance. Tattoos are visually interesting modes of communication. They embody behavioral and symbolic information that can enhance empathy and provoke discussions. They are a way to honor. They are a form of public storytelling. Tattoos use the body as their canvas as they mark life transformation, identity, and relationships. Commemorative tattoos both embody memory and serve as a kind of translator of experience and memory into a language accessible by others. They serve to speak the unspoken by writing in the flesh. Some tattoos tell, tell stories of trauma and telling those stories help people rethink and remake the meaning of trauma. Tattoos can be understood as memory externalized through the relationship between memory, trauma, and one's body. My purpose today is to inform, describe, illustrate, and reflect on trauma as an embodied experience. That is, understanding the body as a site of knowledge where joy, pain, and memory are stored. Commemorative tattoos serve as empowering artifact of trauma and resilience. I reflect on the capacity to make and remake meaning and to integrate trauma into one's life in a way that demonstrates choice, the choice that has been taken away through trauma. The word trauma is used to describe experiences that are emotionally painful and distressing and that overwhelm people's ability to cope, leaving them feel powerless, out of control. Experience, experiencing a traumatic event can harm a person's sense of safety and sense of self, and trauma becomes the elephant in the room. Like the elephant in the room, trauma is fraught by silence and a deadening sensation that defies spoken language, rendering the victim unable to construct a functional narrative to help them move forward toward resilience. And like trauma, tattoos are also wounds. However, they are wounds controlled by choice, such as what, where, when rendering this wound into something restorative, socially acceptable, and the self as resilient, as victor rather than victim. Tattoos serve to remake trauma and to make meaning by constructing a narrative and illustrating the experience for self and others. But why am I asked often, do we want to remember trauma? Remember is comprised of the prefix re, meaning again and again, or to go back and to regenerate. So let us say here that to choose to remember trauma is to remake its meaning under one's own control, the control that was lost during the traumatic event. Visual representations of experiences of violence are diverse. Some represent the experience of violence itself, the healing process, or a strategic hiding of scars associated with assaults. Some of these assaults are self-imposed, such as in cutting. My argument here is that a functional narrative of resilience can be achieved by remembering that tattoos can be part of that work. Jennifer's tattoo, after the trauma of abuse, 
helped her to journey forward as a survivor through, as she says, quiet reflection on her past, present, and future. Please note that some of this work on tattoos related to sexual assault has been done in collaboration with sociology PhD student Mandy Gray. The experience of being tattooed renders a pain of choice, that is, feeling pain as healing after feeling numb because of the assault. Commemorative tattoos are visual representations of trauma and resilience. As Mandy notes, the bird and cage are representative of my experiences of sexual assault. The anchor, my stability and femininity. Tattoos help us remember and remember, that is, to put back together, to regenerate. Stephanie's tattoo illustrates for, an, for us an example of intergenerational trauma. She says, the seven grandfather teachings represent qualities that I would like to achieve in my life. Wisdom, love, respect, bravery, honesty, humility, and truth. This was my way of starting to reclaim my traditional knowledge. I will no longer allow anyone to ask, what are you? I claim my indigenous traditional knowledge. Stephanie continues to say, the 18 tattoos on my body clearly express my connection to my family, my indigenous identity, and my future. Stephanie has contributed her story in my book. I should say that Stephanie was also a sociology undergraduate student at the time this work was being done and she moved on to study law uh, through York. Commemorative tattoos as visual representations of trauma and resilience are seen from Nathan, who says, my tattoos combine my faith with how I wanted to honor the memory of friends I lost in Afghanistan. And from his wife, Kim, my tattoo reminds me who we've become and how fortunate we are because of what others lost. Death by suicide is a traumatic experience that is both silenced and stigmatized. Jason breaks both the silence and challenges the stigma. He says, my daughter Haley died by suicide just two days after her 13th birthday. She faced severe and pervasive bullying at school. These three moms and one dad speak their children's names as they speak their own pain and resilience following suicide. The, uh, the two photos on either end, uh, Daniela and Shane are both teens who died by suicide after bullying the symbol on the hand of the mom in the middle, uh, the young man also died by suicide. And uh, my friend Helena has a, has a skate uh, remembering and honoring her daughter Donna, who died by suicide while she was in her 30s after she suffered from both simultaneously bipolar disorder and Crohn's, Crohn's disease. It was actually uh, getting to know Helena while I was working at as a volunteer at Bereaved Families of Ontario that I started taking an interest in tattoos. Before that, I had none and would never have expected myself to get a tattoo. I met Helena 
her, her tattoo told me a story, a very important story. And I learned that there were a lot of other people who were grieving the loss of loved ones who also had memorial tattoos. That set me on my journey many years ago to get my own tattoos and to study this subject. In conclusion, it is clear from me, from my research, from the stories people tell, that commemorative tattoos are restorative. They render both visible pain and preference. They provide choice. The elephant in the room that is trauma becomes visible. And also, like the elephant to their herd, she assures and assuages. Commemorative tattoos challenge and disrupt. They demonstrate social relations, strength over suffering and adversity, and reveal memory as what we are. This final quote is uh, from my book, and it's through a chapter contributed by Andreas Kitzman, a scholar at York who is in humanities. I thank you for your interest in my research, and I'm very happy to take your questions here and to communicate with you otherwise um, through my York email. I would also like to say that I'm currently working on a project called York Seneca Collaborates. Uh, and this is, uh, it'll have to be done differently because of the pandemic. It'll all be done online, but I'll be doing uh, interviews with people, faculty, staff, students at York and Seneca who have commemorative tattoos. So if you or you know anyone who has a commemorative tattoo and is at York or Seneca, please contact me. Thank you for your interest in this research. Wow, uh, Deborah, thank you so much for, for sharing your research and for sharing um, the lived experiences of so many people that you've engaged with. It was you know, deeply touching and allowed me to see tattoos in a way that I'd never um, thought about them before. So, so thank you so much for sharing of yourself and sharing your, this, this important research. Um, thank you for having me. It's a, it's a real honor. So we now have time to take questions from our audience. So just as a reminder to our audience members, uh, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen on Zoom, uh, or if you're watching on, on Facebook, you can put questions in there. And what I will do is I will read out questions um, that you, you write in and I'll ask them of Deborah on your behalf. So please feel free to send me questions um, as they come. Now, uh, uh, I, would, I would just start with, uh, you know, maybe a first question, certainly one that I have, is you've now opened my mind to the possibility of a, of a tattoo for myself. Um, what advice would you consider for someone first thinking about uh, a tattoo? Well, <clears throat> I'd suggest uh, asking them why they want a tattoo. What is their purpose? Is it something uh, that's symbolic of something? Is it, is it for... Uh, a symbolic reason? If so, uh, how would you best represent that? Uh, you need to think about placement. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, for example, do you want it to be easily seen and, and readily shared? Is it primarily for yourself or do you want to show it? Do you want to be able to you know, hide it effectively? I would suggest that you research tattoo artists uh, visit them, see how you feel in their presence, and ask them lots of questions. So um, one key thing really think about it. Thank you for that. And sorry for my, my, my dog that decided to just bark in the background at the last minute. Um, we have a question that's coming in from Bandel. So thank you for your question. Bandel asks, what are your thoughts on tattoos being stigmatized in many workplaces? Is this level of stigma warranted, especially considering that many tattoos are commemorative? That is a great question. And, you know, one point that I try to make in all my presentations, all my work in tattoos, is that, you know, many people have them. 
that they never have been and certainly are not now uh, limited in any means to their relation to deviance. Uh, I'm coming to understand that more and more uh, employers are uh, not minding tattoos, for example. I know you can have them in the military, you know, not necessarily allowing them to be seen, but it's, it's a very uh, limited and ignorant, pardon me, mindset um, that would stigmatize uh, tattoos in such a way. And one thing I would have to these employers is, why don't you ask a few people about their tattoos? And you know, you may get a very different impression of them. And some places, I think perhaps for baristas, it may be required for the job. Thank you. Thank you for that perspective. And uh, you raise a really good point about inviting conversation and, and actually asking people, especially for tattoos that, that you can readily see. A question coming in from Arlene um, is as follows. Arlene asks, how have commemorative tattoo studies disaggregated according to race, gender, geographic location, and socioeconomic status? Great question. And that work is to be done because there is very little work on commemorative tattoos. There's my work and the work I'm associated with. Um, in terms of uh, what was, um, it was race and socioeconomic status, I believe. Yeah, race, uh, gender, geography, and socioeconomic status. Yeah. Um, as I understand it, about equal numbers of men and women have tattoos um, and in terms of race it's it's often hard to see tattoos on um, on darker skin um, but it is quite prevalent I mean we can certainly see that in in sports figures but the short answer to that excellent question is there is a lot of work to be done in this area. I'm also on a collaborative research projects, and we have put out calls specifically uh, based on, you know, the social category of race. And uh, we haven't had a heck of a lot of luck getting participants in this area. So for anyone who's thinking of, you know, furthering research, and I have an interest in tattoos, this would certainly be, you know, a key area. Uh, as I said, this, this research on primitive tattoos is very new, so we have a lot of room uh, to take it. Thank you, and I think there's a lot of people who uh, just having this, this slice of your research are eager to hear more, and we have a, um, a comment and question that came in from Stella, and Stella says, thank you for this amazing presentation, which I certainly uh, agree with. She asks, um, where can we get your book and your other work? Oh, thank you. Uh, the book was uh, published by uh, Canadian Scholars Press, and you can order it through York Bookstore or through um, Canadian Scholars Press website. Um, I regret to say that because it is uh, an academic publication, it's not as inexpensive as I would like it to be. Moving forward, uh, my next book, which I've not quite planned out yet, but will be done without benefit of an academic press so that the cost can be uh, more accessible to people. I also have uh, a lot of articles that I've published for academic uh, journals, but that the, the, the language of which is very accessible. So if anyone wants access to any of those, I can certainly help them get those um, free of charge if they email me. Fantastic. That's, uh, that, that's a very generous offer. And um, just for folks looking to get in touch, feel free to, to contact through um, our office at alumni at yorku.ca. By the um, way, I, I would like to say that I too am a York alumni. 
I finished undergraduate work at York where I had started earlier um, while I was a mature student. I liked it so much. I went on to do my MA at York and continued on uh, to do my PhD at York. And, and I really value York and sociology in that I'm allowed to do some really cool research because I'm associated with York. We certainly are. It certainly is a, a wonderful and special institution. So um, so, so proud that, uh, that you started and, and stayed with us and continue to do this important work. And I was, it, it was so nice that you shared um, some of the people that were featured in your research and their relationships with, with York as well, right? It, it's just wonderful what a caring, sharing community we are. I wanted to I want to turn to, uh, to a personal um, question. You, you spoke about your own tattoos. Do you have any regrets about any of your own tattoos? Uh, yes and no. Um, if I had known when I got my first tattoo, which was uh, well over 10 years ago, I would have approached it differently. I would have followed the advice that I gave when you asked your first question. How I would have thought more about it, researched more. However, that said, my earlier tattoos also represent me at a time of my personal growth and development, and I have no regrets about that. It's interesting that people who get cover up tattoos often do it because, you know, they were 18 years old and got a tattoo they really didn't think about. Now they're in their 40s and they wanted something really meaningful. However, other people that were in the same boat in their you know, teens and early 20s say that, yes, however, I don't want it covered up because it represents you know, an important part of who I was at that time in my life, and I never want to forget that. I've learned from that. Right, very, very true. Um, and, and it leads me to wonder, uh, what's the relationship between tattoos as body art and tattoos as commemorative? Well, that is a good question. I would argue that if someone wanted a piece of art that was solely for art's sake on their body as a canvas, uh, it still may be considered commemorative. And I'll tell you why. Because it demonstrates their taste in art their choice of the piece of art, and how and where they wish to, uh, to share that art. However, in my own work, when I ask people uh, to participate in a study, the way I define commemorative is how they define. If they define their tattoo as commemorative, that's all I care about in terms of for purposes of my research. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, we, uh, that, that sort of marks the, the end of uh, the questions as they've come in. Are there any additional thoughts that you would like to share with, um, with our, our group before we wrap it up for today? Oh, let me think for a sec. Um, <clears throat> I'm very appreciative for your coming to listen to me. Uh, thank you for your interest. I'm very happy to, um, to share more with you, just contact me at debd at yorku.ca. And um, I have, uh, for those of you who may be specifically interested in memorial tattoos, that is tattoos in memory of uh, deceased loved ones, on my website, uh, the tattooproject.info, there is a, a click on for uh, tattoos as memorials, and it shows uh, a slideshow set to music uh, that you may be uh, particularly interested in viewing. So thank you, Alumni Association, and thank you, viewers. It's been a pleasure. Well, well, well thank you, and um, it's a uh... It's certainly making me reflect upon my own father that I lost 20 years ago and his favorite animal was an elephant. We had elephants all around. So you're bringing back some wonderful memories uh, for, for me personally. So, so thank you so much um, 
for being here and for sharing your work and uh, yourself and um, being a part of this community and doing this research. We really appreciate you taking your time to be here and, uh, and, and uh, being part of this. Okay, so we wish you a wonderful, safe um, rest of your day. And before we say goodbye to the audience, uh, we, we would really like to, uh, to, to thank you. Okay, so to our audience um, that's here, we, we do have one poll question that we'd like to ask you again. Uh, and, and we'd like to ask you what's about to pop up on your screen. How would you rate your understanding of today's topic following this insightful discussion? So it's popped up on your screen and I will give everyone a moment to re respond. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for participating, for your questions, for your thoughtfulness, and joining us today at our Scholars Hub at Home series of events. Please feel free to share this talk with your friends. It will be posted on our York U Alumni YouTube channel. You can also join our LinkedIn group or follow us on Facebook by searching York University Alumni. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at York U Alumni. If you have feedback about this or any of our other programming, we welcome it. And you're welcome to connect with us on our social channels or by email at alumni at yorkie.ca. Scholars Hub at Home is back next week and the topic is titled, Acute Discrimination and the Asian White Mental Health Gap During COVID-19. It's on Wednesday, October 21st at noon Eastern with Dr. Carrie Wu, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology. To learn more about that and see our fall lineup, please visit our website, yorku.ca slash alumni and friends and click on events. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon and be well.